Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our participants in Imagine Aviation. Uh, my name is Steve Clark. I'm the Deputy Associate Administrator for the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters. And welcome to the over 1,700 registrants uh, that we have from around the world. Uh, this is more than double uh, that we had last year. So a uh, huge welcome to everybody and uh, looking forward to spending the next three days with you. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, this year um, we have a graphic artist by the name of Joe Byrne. Welcome, Joe, who is going to be capturing the themes and thoughts from all of our various panels and speaking engagements over the next three days. And she's going to be interpreting and sharing some um, artistry uh, during the breaks and at the end of each day. So we're really looking forward to Joe uh, providing us some inspirational and, and uh, insightful art on the themes. Um, also, we have a live question and answer tool that we're going to be using throughout the three days. Um, and you will be able to ask your questions at all of the speaking engagements. And you should see it on the screen now uh, with the link at the bottom. Um, it's arc.cnf, that's Charlie November Foxtrot. Dot io and you'll be seeing that link uh, throughout the three days and throughout the different presentations so that you can ask your questions. And now it's my distinct honor to introduce uh, the NASA Deputy Administrator, Pam Melroy. So welcome, Pam. Thanks, Steve. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I never forget, as a former test pilot, that the second A in NASA is aeronautics. And in fact, as we were reflecting a little bit earlier, aeronautics has been going on a lot before NASA. Before NASA, it was NACA, which was formed uh, March 13th, 1915. So we're approaching 107 years of investments in aviation. And that's really exciting. Last week, I was visiting Langley, our NASA Langley Research Center in Southern Virginia, which is really the heart of where that aviation work started. And I found myself reflecting as I was visiting the wind tunnels there, what an enormous impact that had. I mean, it's almost impossible for us to think about what it was like when you just put an airplane together and you went and flew it, and then you tweaked it a little bit to try to make it fly better. We lost a lot of airplanes that way. And so this insight that if we could have a wind tunnel that we could test in a variety of conditions and be able to predict the behavior of an aircraft. It was massively transformational. So the investments made in the 40s and the 50s around that and other areas of uh, aviation really led to the golden age of aviation, the jet age in the 60s, which of course was the beginning of commercial aviation, uh, bringing us all together around the world. That's not the only contribution NASA has made. I you know, think about it every time I fly in a commercial airliner and I look out at the winglets uh, that have uh, transformed the ability uh, for crews and uh, saving fuel that, that has had an enormous impact. Um, in addition to that, in, in more modern areas, um, engine controllers. So we always worry about engines when you're flying an airplane. And so advanced engine controllers uh, take on board a lot more digital information and can control the engine and prevent bad things from happening. NASA had a hand in the development of those advanced engine controllers as well. And even the air traffic control system in the United States was essentially developed by NASA. So when you look at the impact uh, in the past, NASA has had a huge impact on aviation. Yeah, Pam, and that was one of the big surprises for me uh, when I when I transitioned over to the aeronautics side of NASA um, after being on the space side for so many years was that the, the air traffic control system was developed uh, along with the FAA um, okay. and in research and mm -hmm. provided to the FAA and they operate it today. I, that just astounded me. And um, and, you know, we didn't stop there. We're continuing to develop right. and evolve the air traffic management system, not just in the air, um, we are 
looking at the next generation of air traffic management for in-flight. Um, as, as you can imagine, all of these new entrants are coming into play now, not just the small drones, but now we're looking at larger potential passenger carrying electric aircraft. And so our airspace is going to become very busy, um, busier than what it is today. And so we need the next generation air traffic management system to be able to incorporate all these different kinds of vehicles at different altitudes, um, particularly around urban areas coming right. into various airports, regional, international airports. Um, but we're also doing a lot on the ground. And you know, a lot of people don't think about it's it's almost a ballet of how you you move aircraft the most efficient way on the ground at airports. Um, and so in our airspace technology demonstration um, yes. project, over a span of four years from September 2017 to September 2021, we did work at the Charlotte Douglas Airport. And we were able to help optimize the movement of aircraft so that when aircraft pushed away from the gate, they would be able to go almost directly out to the runway and take off and not just sit in line. And so what does that do? Well, it saved over 1 million gallons of aviation fuel over that four years. And more importantly, it saved 23 million pounds of CO2, carbon dioxide, wow. from being emitted into the air because the aircraft weren't sitting there just running their engines. And so um, that continues to operate, that system continues to operate at Charlotte Douglas. We, we've turned it over to the FAA and we're doing work at the Dallas Fort Worth and Love Field. And so the FAA will be incorporating this over the next few years um, across the country and at these airports to optimize the movement of aircraft on the ground as well as in the air. So, well, and I love that because yeah. it means, you know, less time in the airplane, right? For me, I get on, we push back, we fire up the engines, push back and go. Uh, so a lot more efficient use of everybody's time. And then you add the sustainable piece. What's not to love about that? Yeah. It, in fact, another statistic, it saved about 930 hours, passenger hours Ooh. over that four years. So, yeah. So NASA is continuing to evolve the air traffic management system on the ground and in the air with the FAA and with the airports and the airlines. Um, so exciting times. So I, I mentioned about, you know, the, the gallons of fuel that were saved and and the CO2 that was saved. If we take a step back and, and look at, at what's the economic impact of all of this work that NASA does with their partners. And the aviation industry with the direct work that is done along with the secondary sectors that support right. all, of, all of the direct uh, significance that we have, uh, we're, we contribute over greater than 5% of the gross domestic product. I mean, that's a huge economic engine. And they're great jobs, too. Yeah, uh, we're yeah. talking over 11 million yeah. jobs. Yeah. And we're talking roughly $1.8 trillion of economic activity. Wow. And so we want to be able to maintain or sustain that economic um, sustainability, actually increase it if we can as well. Um, so um, that, that plays into sustainability of the U.S. aviation industry being a global leader but also from a from a uh, climate standpoint as well, which is very, uh, very much on the front pages these days, and certainly one of the administration priorities. Well, it's a it's a priority I think for everyone because it's an existential threat to all of us. And uh, aviation has been identified as one of the hardest industries to decarbonize, but it's contributing two to three percent of global emissions. So uh, this sounds like NASA to the rescue for me, a very, very difficult technical problem. And it's important. It's not just important to the United States. It's not just important to NASA. Uh, the global aviation community has pledged to cut emissions by half by 2050. So we better get going. There's a lot of work to do on that. Definitely. So we're very focused on that right now. There's a lot of exciting work going on in a variety of areas. I think the um, one of the things that really excites me is uh, electric aviation. So uh, you've probably heard, I hope many of you are on, who are investing your time in uh, electric and hybrid electric VTOL. 
Uh, that is a growing community. NASA is really focused on bringing that community together, staying focused on what their challenges are and what they're trying to solve. One of the things for me as a test pilot that I, I really believe is that you can best transition technologies when you have the opportunity to demonstrate it first and burn down all that risk. And that's what we do in X-Planes. And uh, NASA has an X-Plane called X-57, and it is an all-electric, zero-emission aircraft. Solving some of those really hard problems for electric and high, future hybrid electric aviation. In addition to that, uh, supporting the community around modeling and several other areas. That's really important. I think the other thing that gets me excited about this particular uh, community and this idea of electric and hybrid electric VTOL is that uh, we have 5,000 airports in the United States, but many of them are underutilized. 90% of our population lives within 30 minutes of one of those airports. But because aviation has been expensive, you don't see a lot of commercial aviation at a lot of those uh, more rural fields. Well, the bringing down the cost, it's not just the emissions, it's also the cost uh, and the operability of, these, uh, of the electric VTOL community means that we have the potential to really impact rural communities and connect them more to better jobs, opportunities. It's about infrastructure. So to me, that is one of the big promises of electric aviation. And, you know, good point on the on the rural areas. And, and that ties back to the economic uh, yeah. engine, right, mm -hmm. is, is if we can um, bring those jobs to the more rural areas and make the connections between the rural and metropolitan areas, I mean, we're looking at um, a lot of what we call public good use cases um, that tie all this together. Um, it, we're working right now uh, doing a national campaign where we have commercial partners uh, that are working with us to not only um, test their aircraft, but also various um, air traffic management systems, as I mentioned before, about tying all this into a complex airspace. And these electric vehicles are taking advantage of a lot of the work, as you mentioned, Pam, mm -hmm. on, on X-57, the distributed mm -hmm. electric propulsion, um, all electric. Um, and the battery technology mm -hmm. um, has, has also transferred over to the, um, the new entrants and the commercial market. The Department of Energy has helped in, in the battery density technology maturation. Um, so all of this is coming together uh, to really realize full electric aircraft. Um, and if some of you remember the Jetsons cartoon, well, that's becoming real. It's We are on the cusp of being able to fly those electric vehicles and have passengers uh, on board. So it's really exciting. It, it's gonna have a transformational impact on so many people and so many lives. You know, let's face it, that's one of the things that's so exciting about working in aviation. Not only are planes cool, uh, in addition to that, it's really actually about making people's lives better by connecting them. And uh, this this really is a huge step forward and NASA is really proud to be a part of that, without a doubt. And you know, one, one public good use case I wanted to mention um, is, you know, there are models out there, scenarios that some of these new entrants are looking at where they could potentially fly surgeons or doctors, specialty doctors, mm -hmm. out to those rural areas from the metropolitan areas very quickly um, and be able to um, service the community there or even fly the, you know, the passengers mm -hmm. or the, the patients, I should say, mm -hmm. to the metropolitan areas where there's the specialized equipment and so forth. Um, so, you know, not sitting in, a, in traffic yeah. trying to get to a metropolitan area it takes yeah. two hours where you can just hop over and fly at some of these rural airports, right? And and be able to uh, to really provide more of these services to more people. Um, that's right. So that's just one area that, that mm -hmm. a lot of these new entrants are looking at. And that's, I'm pretty excited about yeah, that as that well. Yeah, that is huge impact. So we got another X-Plane coming too though, don't we? Yes. And it's also about connecting people? Yes, we do. It's, uh, it's called the X-59, uh, which is the low boom flight demonstrator. And um, this is this is an aircraft that actually is almost finished being built. Uh, it's being built by Lockheed Martin. And um, I had the opportunity 
uh, to go out to Fort Worth to the Lockheed Martin plant there where the aircraft had been shipped from Palmdale, California to the Fort Worth facility to undergo ground proof load testing. And it, it came through flying colors. But that was the first time we had seen the aircraft uh, in its what I'll call final state uh, from the outside looking at it. And it, it was just so impressive. You can see it on NASA.gov. It's a very unusual uh, shape, it, that is yes, for sure. Has an extremely long nose. Um, now it's one of a kind aircraft. Yes. Um, and it, it is not a passenger carrying aircraft. There is one pilot um, and with the nose being so long um, and it's a smooth mold line that the pilot can't see out. He is or she is going to be relying on an external vision system. Yeah, we'll go with she first. We'll go with she. <laughs> <laughs> and um, use this external vision system that NASA actually developed and is uh, provided to Lockheed Martin to integrate into the aircraft. And so this aircraft, what is the purpose of it? Well, we are looking to gather data as we fly over communities to with big, uh, basically microphone arrays to capture the sound as this aircraft flies supersonic. Because right now, under FAA regulations, and, and even with the International Civil Aviation Organization, um, the regulations are that we can't fly supersonic over land. Why is that? Well, the sonic boom that reaches the ground can rattle windows, it scares people and so forth like that. So back during the Concorde days, you could only fly supersonic over the oceans. So with the low boom flight demonstrator, we hope to get this data to show that this design actually quiets that supersonic um, sound to maybe a thump. And so we've already talked to various communities that we're gonna be doing these overflights on over the next uh, few years once we start flying. And with that data, we're going to deliver that to the International Civil Aviation Organization and the international regulators, including the FAA, will be looking at this to see if we can actually open up supersonic travel over land. And if so, it's going to open up a huge new market to be able to do that, where we can actually realize maybe flying from New York to Tokyo in four hours, right, and, and really increase our ability to get to places sooner. Right. So it's yeah, pretty exciting. as somebody who travels a lot, yeah. uh, even just cutting the time to get from Washington to California in half would be a pretty big impact. But you're right, the global impact uh, could be could be amazing. And uh, again, it's about it's about connecting people. I mm -hmm. think it's uh, finding new ways to do that, and uh, you know, bringing us together around the world. It's a, it's a good thing. And anyway, it's also a very cool airplane. I just have to say, I think. I think some of the uh, fascinating technologies, uh, especially that have to do with the fact that there's no cockpit, uh, the, you know, I think that's going to enable a lot of other capabilities as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think you're right. Yeah. So yeah. we hope to see that fly by the end of this year, actually. So it, it's due to be shipped back the middle of this month, March, back to Palmdale to be finished. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have to have the, the paint job. That's right. Right. And then we'll we'll start doing taxi tests and first flight by the end of this calendar. Year. Well, and you know what else is cool about this? Normally, we test pilots, you know, take off our airplane from our test base, fly around in an area, do our tests and land. And so I'm excited that we're going to be flying this airplane all over America. So America can see the latest NASA X-Plane, and remember about that second A in NASA. So I'm excited Absolutely. about that. And and of course, we're we're looking at the next X-Plane in yes. the pipeline, which yeah. I think you can share I'd with, with our participants. I'd love to talk there, about the please. future. Yeah, let's shift gears to the future. We've talked about the past and the present. Let's talk about the future for a few minutes. So, um, boy, I talked about decarbonization. This is a really tough problem. And so we're, we're looking to attack the problem from multiple angles. You will hear a lot about that over the next few days and the things that we're encouraging, uh, not, that we're doing, but we're also encouraging our partners to focus on as well uh, because, because there are some really big challenges. So this is a sustainable flight national partnership that we're working with many other agencies and industry to, uh, to advance. Uh, but the next X plane coming down the pike is going to be a subsonic flight demonstrator. So it's really fantastic to work on electric and VTOL aviation that will especially have an impact 
uh, regionally. Uh, but when we're uh, talking about emissions, the potential to uh, impact the wide body uh, aircraft of today that are are that we use to take ourselves uh, long haul and around the world, um, that would have a huge impact. So this subsonic flight demonstrator is going to demonstrate a series of technologies that have the potential to reduce emissions 20 to 25 percent. And so stay tuned for more news on that. Um, that'll be um, very exciting. Yeah, and we've been engaged with industry uh, mm -hmm. talking about that because uh, the the airlines and, and Boeing and, and the other mm -hmm. GEs and the Pratts and, and all of the aerospace companies really have their sights set on having the next generation aircraft in the 2030s. And that's why we're doing this. We want to we want to be able to test these technologies and turn it over to industry to incorporate into the next generation aircraft. That, that is so important. We just don't do technology just for technology's sake. It's actually about uh, transitioning it and getting it out there and having people use it and having an impact. Uh, that's what we're all about at NASA is having that impact. We're not just focused on the future of technology, though. We're also focused on our own future, especially our future workforce. So one of the things that's really important to understand is that we work on really hard problems at NASA. That, that's what we do. And so what that means is we have to have a workforce that is prepared to take on pretty complex technical problems. As we go on, we find that there's the intersections between technologies is where the magic is happening. And so we have to have a diversity of experience and thought. We can't afford to keep going back to the same few sources to hire a workforce. So one of the things that I'm especially proud of the Aeronautics Directorate is the University Leadership Initiative. And uh, that's the opportunity to connect with a lot of universities that we have not traditionally worked with before, including a lot of minority serving institutions as well. That enables us to partner with those universities to uh, enable research in areas that are important to us, but also to build partnerships and to build pipelines for our workforce and the workforce of industry uh, for the future. We think that's critically important. And you know what's what's really interesting about that ULI project? Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Is the way it's set up is the way the universities basically bid on these grants. Is there is a lead university, but they need to have basically what I call a cohort of other universities. So there are you know these teams they're already starting to learn about how to work as teams across geographical diverse areas as well with the different universities, different colleges, different people. And, and you mentioned about, you know, the, the diversity of thought yeah. and it, it's just fantastic what some of the some of the projects um, that have been briefed, they've actually presented to uh, the leadership here in, in the aeronautics research mission directorate. And it's it's just fascinating how they've solved these these problems. And we're really looking forward to maybe even getting some of them into actually testing in wind tunnels and stuff like that. So, yeah, when you have diverse teams you end up getting a lot of creativity out of that. So that's that's what excites me because we need that. We, we've solved a lot of the low hanging fruit. We're, we're working on really hard problems for the future. Uh, speaking of which, um, we have even harder problems that we have to solve. Uh, I hope that many of you saw the first aircraft fly on another planetary body, Ingenuity. The Ingenuity helicopter, I, I don't know, for me as a, as a pilot and as a test pilot, I just was like, oh my gosh, I'm present at a Wright Brothers moment. This is witnessing something that we've never seen before. NASA is also working on a project with our partners called Dragonfly uh, to fly an aircraft uh, in the atmosphere of Titan, which is uh, an outer solar system moon. So, um, we're beginning to see a little bit of a convergence here mm -hmm. in space and aeronautics. And I think that we're going to continue to see that convergence grow. So the opportunities and the challenges are opening up ahead of us. And uh, we're very excited actually to welcome you all here uh, because we, we have a lot of interesting stuff going on and exciting things going on. And we've got a lot of work ahead of us too. Yeah, I mean, how inspiring is that is to be able to work on a project that you may be flying and yes, literally flying 
with propellers, like Ingenuity has props mm -hmm. on it, to fly on another planetary body. I mean, it, it's just phenomenal. I, I, I can't even imagine what it was like to work on that project and, and the folks that are on the Dragonfly mm -hmm. project. That's right. And there will be more. And, and as you said, I think we're leveraging the strengths across NASA to really converge on solving mm -hmm. these hard challenges, not only here on Earth, but, but even you know, on other planetary bodies in the solar system. And so, with our partners. And with our partners. And so, you know, this is what inspiring, I use that word inspiring. I hope you see where we're inspiring the next generation of women and men, aeronautical researchers, scientists, um, all different disciplines to really bring about a new and bright, sustainable future. And, you know, this is all invigorating the U.S. Um, aviation industry, right? It's working with our industrial partners, working with academia, working with other government agencies. It's just really in continuing to invigorate um, all of all of the partners that are working towards common goals and how we're infusing these new technologies, innovative, revolutionary technologies that are really going to help improve life here on Earth for everybody, not just Americans, but over across the world. So I'm excited about it. And, and Inspire, I, I it's a great, invigorate, infuse. That's the next few days, right? A lot yeah. of great stuff to talk about. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, with that, I think we're going to start taking some questions from everybody. And uh, we'll look forward to hopefully providing you some good answers. Well, thank you, Pam and Steve. Uh, it's such an exciting talk, uh, su such great themes. Um, I, 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 get, I hear such a variety of themes throughout that, and it, it makes you really proud to understand the impact that, that the agency and NASA and our, and our partners and universities in the private sector have on actually civil aviation, the economic development of the nation. It's, it's really exciting, and, and, I, and I know I'm very excited for these next uh, three days as well. So we do. I would like to welcome everyone uh, to put in their questions into the chat box. And uh, the link there again, as I pull it up, is arc.cnf.io sessions. It is up on your screen now. Welcome your questions. We have a wonderful opportunity here to, to ask two of our leaders who are, who are spending their time with us today. So I did want to start off. Uh, and Pam, I'll start off with you. Uh, such great themes we've heard there, but, but as an aviator yourself, where do you see NASA aeronautics future contributions having the greatest impact, maybe in the next 15, 20, 30 years? Yeah, that's a great question, Steve. I'll, I'll tell you uh, my view on this. Uh, I, I spent some time actually at DARPA uh, with uh, overseeing the air and space portfolio there. So the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which really does the very very uh, futuristic, more, you know, more the 20 year impact, but really that's just a part of the portfolio. So the way, the way I look at this is that we need to have a robust portfolio that is solving the problems that industry needs today. I think that's really important uh, because of the economic impact. That's, that's uh, absolutely critical, but I think we always need to have a part of our portfolio the subsonic flight demonstrator being a great example, something we know that's going to impact aviation in the 2030s, right? So that's perfect for um, our X-plane activity is to be looking maybe a little further out, something that has more of an impact in about 10 years. And then we always need to keep a little bit of seed corn for the really crazy stuff, right? You never know which one of those things might be that thing in 20 years. So it's really important to actually be looking across the whole portfolio that way. You know, that, and that's a really good point about the seed corn and, mm -hmm. and looking at way beyond the horizon, right? It's, mm -hmm. um, in fact, we have uh, folks within the uh, Aeronautics Research Mission Director that do just that. Mm -hmm. They are constantly looking to see what is, what are people working on? What are people, what kind of concepts are out there that may stick, may not, but you don't know until you kind of poke at it a little bit and see what's there, you know? So, you know, for instance, here in the U.S., we are going all towards electric, right? But mm -hmm. our European partners are looking very seriously at hydrogen-powered mm -hmm. aircraft. Great example. Um, but they're they're looking at an infrastructure there where their public transportation system, planes, trains, automobiles, mm -hmm. um, 
they could they could potentially rely on a hydrogen infrastructure. Um, and we're looking at, at that as well as a potential option. Right now, working with our industry partners, we're, we're gearing more towards the electric side. But um, just fascinating ideas out there in materials, research, yeah. um, something I didn't mention before, hypersonics. Yes. Right. Yes. Beyond supersonic. Oh, yeah. That's another place where you see you know air and space that. coming back through the Earth's atmosphere as an astronaut. I'm flying at Mach 25 in the space shuttle, which is acting like a giant airplane. So, uh, yeah, I see hypersonics as the seam between air and space. And uh, boy, that's that's not New York to Tokyo in four hours. That's New York to Tokyo in 45 minutes. <laughs> I mean, wow. You know, it's fascinating, right? It, like I said, <laughs> Who would have thought we would be actually flying prototype electric vehicles right, right now, like the Jetson? That's that's not out of the realm of possibility. And I know there's commercial interest out there. Yeah, and I think this is a great example of, of and Pam, and, and well, you both mentioned it, of, of stretching even what we know, even what we're comfortable with, uh, to really explore the crazy next thing, because we don't know what it will be until we discover it. So that, that is the excitement that you, that you feel within the agency, and it, it, it's why a lot of people tune in, a lot of people work with us. Uh, we do, and you mentioned the University Leadership Initiative, and we're, we're going to follow up a little later this morning with some great conversations with students. But but I'd like to ask either of you, I mean, that's such a wonderful program to develop not only future, uh, future technolo technologists and leaders for the agency, but for private sector as well. Uh, but there's a question in, that came in that, that is, is really interesting is, what do you see as the most difficult aspect of actually training or preparing our future workforce? Wow. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, one of them is retention, right? Um, just, uh, you know, helping people really stick with it. Um, I, I, you know, I think all of us who have, um, ad, ad, you know, advanced degrees uh, recognize that, you know, if you're going to tackle physics and engineering and math, um, those, you know, those course, those courses, they take work. You, you really have to make that investment up front. I think one of the great things about uh, the NASA partnership, though, and I know I felt this way when I was in college and I was sometimes discouraged, uh, was that I dreamed of one day flying in space and being a pilot. And so for me, I had a reason to stick with it. It was something that I really wanted to do. Uh, I think also being exposed to engineers and pilots who were working helped me really understand, no, that you don't have to be superhuman to graduate, right? These people are all regular people and they're working on problems that I'm excited about and I can actually understand and, and think about and contribute to. So uh, to me, the retention actually is one of the biggest issues. But when we bring in the built-in motivation of our mission and the things we're trying to accomplish, I hope that helps. Yeah, and maybe what I pull off that too is once once we have the folks is the mentoring aspects, yes. right? Yeah. There are a lot of times where folks come in and, and I'm gonna tell you from my personal experience, I, I had really good mentors um, throughout my career. People who can kind of help guide you and somebody you can go to and talk with saying, you know, these are the kind of issues I'm dealing with. And, and particularly when you first come into the, to the field, you know, there's so much to right. soak in and it's almost drinking from the fire hose. It's like, how do I prioritize and time management? That's always, that's yeah. always a big one, right? Yeah. For all of us. But having mentors help guide you through your career and help you make, you know, give you sage advice to allow you to make your own decisions yeah. on what paths you want to go to or yeah. go down. Um, it's been very beneficial to me. I still have mentors now, but I really enjoy, and now I'm starting to feel like the gray beard literally is being a mentor to many people uh, that I've been able to work with over over my career and, and I've seen them rise up in various leadership positions or they're staying purely technical, which right. is they really want to stick with the research and the, the pure technical aspects, which we need folks in all areas, right? Not just yeah. the technical, accounting, contracts, human resources. We, we need all of those yeah. disciplines to really make it work and retain people. And that dynamic is really important because I think I think people who are fresh to the field come in and ask questions that we thought we knew the answers to. Uh, and having mentors who 
don't say, no, we already thought about that. You can't do it. But instead say, well, here are the three things you need to think about. Um, these are the reasons why we haven't done it before, because these three things are really hard to do. And that focuses all that energy on new ideas, in, and but makes it productive and gives you a chance of actually getting something out of it. So that, that partnership, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, lo I love how you talk about the mentoring and you talk about it from both sides. It's okay. not just the, the graybeards, as you say, Steve, transferring your wisdom to others. That's part of it, but it is that reverse mentoring. It's, Pam, as you mentioned, asking those questions, asking for better ways to do it from a fresh perspective. Uh, it, it's just, I've seen the successes in it. I've seen uh, how our programs help develop through mentoring within the agency and with our combination and partnerships with private sector as well. But Another way where I, I really see success in this is when we when we give when we give all aspects of the workforce, young, mid career, or senior career, the opportunity for collaborative research to actually work together on things. So there's a question in the in the chat that is really relevant to that is uh, to either of you. Where do you see the opportunity for collaborative research and technology development across the NASA NASA mission directorates? Uh, uh, between the directorates then, not just right. in aeronautics. Yeah. Oh, yep. yeah. yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you're singing my song, whoever you are. So, <laughs> because uh, because I, I think uh, I, I did come into the agency with that recognition. And uh, there are, I think there are some really exciting opportunities uh, as we expand out into the solar system. So, uh, one of the things that I think is really important is bringing, we brought all the directorates together to talk about, um, to talk about what are our objectives uh, for uh, expansion out of exploration in the solar system with humans and robotics mm -hmm. and aeronautics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do think that, um, that as we go out in exploration beyond Earth orbit, uh, those we really are going to need to leverage every part of NASA to do it. So uh, to me, that means everything from, you know, how are we going to do science on other planets with humans? We're doing it pretty well on Mars with a robot, right? And a rover. Uh, but, you know, once we add humans into the mix and um, uh, space is work, uh, space technology is working on a hopper. Uh, so it's kind of like a UAV, but it doesn't need it, it doesn't need atmosphere for the moon. So, but it'll hop off your rover, go check something out and hop back. So uh, a different kind of aeronautics, I guess. But. Well, and, and exactly, we're, we're working very closely, we being uh, ARMD mm -hmm. with the science mission director yes. and space technology mission director as well in what Pam just described, not only the exploration in the solar system, but here on earth, um, here an example, um, we all have been reading over the last couple of years about the increased wildfires um, happening, at, particularly out west. And NASA saw that this was a national priority, a national need. And we started talking amongst ourselves, how can we help um, fight fight this um, national need? Uh, you know, help the firefighters. And so we're working very closely with the science mission directorate uh, in particular. They have the Earth uh, science Earth observation spacecraft providing all kinds of data and have been for years um, on the atmosphere, on natural disasters and so forth. And so the science mission directorate folks and ARMD met with the uh, wildfire community last fall and really sat down with them and said, what do you need? You know, we didn't bring a bunch of stuff to the table and say, this is what we can do in NASA. We listened. We asked, what can we do to help? And I tell you, they they opened up the coffers. They, they basically said, we need um, to know what the fires are doing real time. We need to get the data down to the pe mm -hmm. the boots, the folks on the ground that are fighting it. Um, we need like 24 seven monitoring of how the fire, particularly at night. Um, and it, they, you know, that's when fires tend to get a little less severe. Although we're starting to see now where that's actually increasing um, during the nighttime hours as well. So if and we could, they needed the air traffic control for the UAVs that they were using in the tankers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yes, right, who could help with that? There, yeah. Ex well, we talked about air traffic management, right? On the civil aviation side, mm -hmm. how do you bring in tankers and drones 
and and other types of vehicles that are fighting these fires, right? And basically not have them run into each other, right? right? Um, it's a safety aspect, and there have been accidents, right? And, and bring in the earth science data oh, yeah. to give them the situational awareness. Yeah. So we're continuing to to talk with the wildfire community and and, and applying our expertise, and we're going to continue to do that and. In fact, it's it's captured um, the interest of the White House. Yes. Um, to to look at okay, let's pull in the other agencies as well, and let's let's really find a good way to to apply our expertise across the government to to address this national need. And I can see this going into other priorities as well. The that power, is an. Ex oh, I'm sorry, Pam. Go ahead. Just wanted to say it's the power of partnership. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that is really exciting to hear that the partnerships across the agency, across other governmental agencies uh, to, to solve the greatest needs there are. And that was one of the wonderful messages and themes that came across in, in your talk. It's connecting people, as you mentioned, Pam. Um, but I also heard a cross-cutting theme of almost economic development or, or spurning economic development. If it's the low boom demonstrator or if it's the work in the sustainable flight national partnership, all of this really can lead to the growth of the economy. So when we talk about partnerships with our other governmental agencies, how important is it also for NASA to work with our partners to transition our technological developments to the, the private sector and the marketplace? It's uh, critical. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, ARMD, um, and, and I try not to use too many acronyms here, right? But but it's the Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate. It is one of the what i call the key mission directorates that does that every day we are in partnership with industry on just about everything we do in the portfolio uh, because what we want to do we we are not doing research or technology development just for nasa right we are doing it to meet a goal and that is to turn over this technology this research to our industry partners to further mature and integrate into everyday technology that's used in the commercial aviation world. And so um, it's it's really almost a 50-50 partnership on, on everything we do. We we look at what their objectives are. Um, we bring the, F, the FAA in as well. What are the objectives here from a, a air traffic control standpoint, regulation standpoint? Everybody has to be on the same page to be able to transfer this technology and be used efficiently um, in industry. And of course, industry is in business to make money. And that goes back to the economic uh, engine that we talked about earlier and what you talked about, Steve, as well. So um, partnerships are, are key, and Pam mentioned this too, um, to really meeting objectives, common objectives, and, and for the good of all. Right. It, it, that's that's why we're here. That's why we tackle the hard challenge. Yeah. And I will not pretend tech transfer is really hard. It is a really hard thing to do. So uh, listening, partnering, um, actually, you know, paying attention to what the trends are and what people need. Uh, it's it's all a part of it. And I personally think aeronautics does it extremely well. And one, one other thing on collaboration you mentioned, Steve, is, is uh, something, again, coming over to ARMD and, and seeing how everything works now and being involved with it. Every project that we have within the Mission Directorate involves our four aeronautical centers, mm -hmm. Langley, Glenn, Ames, and Armstrong. We do not have a center-focused project. We have project team members from all four centers on all of the projects. I mean, talk about a collaboration model. I mean, it's been working well for years, and it continues to work well. And I, I really, I when I talk to my colleagues and some of the other mission directors, I said, hey, you ought to really take a look at this <laughs> on, I'm not saying that they don't collaborate with the various, you know, space flight centers and so forth, but there could be some additional things you could do maybe to increase that collaboration. It's a really been, been interesting learning about how the collaboration works within the aeronautics mission director. Yeah, that is really f fun to watch that. And I think it excite it, that's part of what excites our earlier careers as well, the opportunity to work with others across the country and to meet new people that, that they might know and work with for, for 30 years. And it, it, it's really exciting. We're, we're coming near the end of this, so I'll throw one last question from the chat at you and, and, and end with, with, the, with the good one here is, 
either one for for either of you and both of you. What is the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity that NASA faces today? Uh, <laughs> That's not a softball, Steve. I uh, know it's not. It's the I, I finished off with us like a slider, but I have confidence in your abilities. <laughs> I, I think they're all usually the same thing. Um, you you just it's it's the framework that you look at it. I I will say the pace of technology uh, and the impact that it has on society, our ability to keep up with that, um, to really understand the implications of the technology that we're doing and to think a few chess moves ahead. So in the past, it's meant, hey, let's talk to the FAA about making sure that if this technology works, it could be certified, right? That's that's a couple of good chess moves ahead. Uh, we, we've got to be thinking now three, four, five chess moves ahead because of the pace of change. That That's just my perception is um, that, that things are changing. And so it gets to sort of this multidisciplinary. We're talking a lot about STEM, but the truth is there are societal impacts to everything we do. And we've seen that advanced technology doesn't always, uh, first of all, it doesn't always create justice um, and equity. Uh, in addition to that, we don't always think through what the um, unintended consequences are. So uh, for me, it is it is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for us to shape the world to be a better place if we spend the time thinking about it. But. You know, and, and I completely agree with you, Pam, on that. Um, and, and I think all of that lines up to what are we facing today? And and it's, it is truly a changing climate. And and aviation, as as Pam mentioned, is a is a significant contributor to uh, the emissions, right? That affects uh, what's going on with our atmosphere. And challenge and opportunity is sitting there right in front of us now. Is we need to really go to the next level on having a sustainable aviation um, ecosystem. Um, now is the time, and, and you're seeing it in Europe and Asia as well. This is a true global effort that we need everybody, not just the U.S., but everybody to buy into this, to go to that next level, mm -hmm. to improve life for everybody on the planet. And mm -hmm. I, I just, it's, I feel honored and, and, and humbled to be part of this organization, to be able to help move the technology advancement, to hopefully see that future of cutting emissions by 50 percent um, in by 2050 and and maybe even zero emissions by 2060. Um, so I'm excited about it. And so it's great. It's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for the Q&A. Steve, I'll turn it over to you for any little, last final remarks from yourself and Pam. So thank you to all the people that sent in questions. OK, thank you, Steve. Uh, Pam, would you like to? No, yep, let's. OK. Let's wrap. All right. Well, we've got an exciting three days ahead of us, right? Mm -hmm. This is just the very start of it. And and I hope everybody is excited as as we are to to jump into this. And you've heard the three themes of, of Imagine Aviation, inspire, right? Um, invigorate and infuse. And you're going to hear a number of speakers and see a number of videos throughout the next three days that are going to have those themes. And of course, again, we have Joe Byrne, the graphic artist, who is going to provide some visuals along those themes as well. So um, I'm very excited about kicking this off. And Pam, I can't thank you enough for, for kicking this off for us. This yeah. has been a, a pleasure and an honor. Fantastic. I know it's going to be a really exciting three days. And with that, so we just happen to have our Imagine Aviation pins. So please join We're us on our journey. You. Yes, over the next three days and um, participate, ask questions and enjoy. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>